Okay, a third Jiggy Nushla, it's Misha Robert Driscoll, our consul here in Chile, San Francisco. Uh, friends, uh, my name is Robert Driscoll, Ireland's consul general here in San Francisco, and it is my honor to welcome you to Ireland House San Francisco. This is our <laughs> this is our uh, first uh, public event of uh, since we opened uh, in uh, since we moved here in December last year. We had a little Omicron hump to get over, um, but it seems like we're, we're, we're doing well. And of course, we've had great news on the relaxation of, of um, the health mandates here over the last couple of weeks. So it feels like we're on a good trajectory as we head towards, uh, as we go, sorry, we're in March. We're in March. We're in our very own, our very own March madness. Um, those of you who are at the Irish Centre on Friday night would have seen um, uh, Commissioner Jim Byrne be recognised as the Grand Marshal St. Patrick's Day Parade. Uh, the first, the first of a number of events, of course, over what is also Irish American Heritage Month here in the United States. And I'd recommend anyone who hasn't seen it, check out President Biden's proclamation yesterday in Irish, Her Irish American Heritage Month. Uh, always makes you stand just a little bit taller. Um, so, so a couple of things for me, uh, opening, just opening points. Um, one, we've, done, we've been celebrating St. Bridges Day over the course of, of February. If you haven't seen our events, they're online, they're on our YouTube. The theme was Women Disruptors Throughout History. Uh, it's a really, really uh, uh, well-received uh, program of four talks, uh, going back from St. Bridget all the way to Women in Tech today. So please check that out if you get a chance. And for all your St. Patrick's Day events, uh, check out Irish Culture Bay Area. There's an app on your phone. You can download it. It has all the events and activities on there. We support through the Emigrant Support Program. I think it's really, really important. Before I begin, I just want to recognize a few people in the crowd today. We have the city treasurer, Jose Cisneros, uh, at the back there. Thank you very much for joining us. And we also have our Italian and uh, Spanish consul general colleagues. So please, maybe wait. Some, yeah, please, thank you very much. <laughs> EU solidarity has been huge over the last number of years for us, so we're delighted you can join us here today. And so just to get, kick, kick off now, I'm going to introduce our two speakers today. We have uh, my boss, uh, the Secretary General, the non-political head of our Department of Foreign Affairs, beaming in all the way from Ireland, uh, Joe Hackett, a bit like the Eurovision. Uh, Joe, Joe Hackett is here. Um, Secretary General was appointed uh, last year as Secretary General, and before that he was Director General of our EU Division. He also served as our Deputy Permanent Rep Representative of Ireland to the European Union for two years before that and is our permanent representative to the EU's Political and Security Committee. He's enormous experience at European level, and his insights there are going to be really, really uh, uh, helpful. We're also joined by our good friend, Derry native Matt Regan, although he tells me now he's a resident of Donegal when he goes back home. Good choice. Uh... <laughs> I, I, I still cheer for Derry come uh, uh, football season. I don't, I don't have that against you. I don't have that against you. It's been difficult to cheer for the Gloves over the last while. Um, but Matt's been here, as you know, for, for a long time, working at the Barry Economic Council. Uh, he's a senior, a senior vice president uh, working on um, public policy, very thoughtful on these issues and very obviously interested in what's developments in, in Ireland uh, and across Europe. So without further ado, I'm going to kick it off to the Secretary General and let him make some introductory remarks, and then we'll go into in conversation with Matt. Okay, thank you very much for joining us again this morning. Good morning, Matt. Yeah, well, um, good morning to everyone there. Uh, Robert, thanks very much for the uh, kind and generous introduction, and, and I look forward to, to talking to Matt and, and taking whatever questions you have, and I'm happy to take any questions on, on any subject, but I, I gather we're going to mostly focus on on Brexit, Northern Ireland, EU, uh, anything else you want to ask is, is fine um, as well. Look, I just want to start off by apologizing for the fact that you're seeing me on a, on a large screen rather than uh, in person. Um, I was really looking forward to being there in San Francisco uh, and being with Robert and our team at the New Ireland House, uh, but developments in Ukraine, as we've all seen, are so serious and of such profound significance for the world, but, but certainly for those of us in Europe and in the European Union. And there are many layers to that crisis that we can come to later, but it just wasn't possible for me to get away. And, and that's why I'm joining you by screen today. And we can touch on some of that uh, later. Uh, but look, I'm, I, I'm really conscious of the strength of our relationship here in Ireland with the Bay Area, with San Francisco, with California, and of course, with the United States. Um, that is a rich historic one based on people first and foremost and i'm pleased that our irish community and irish american community in the areas is, is as strong and vital as ever 
but it is of course also a very rich economic and business research and, and tech relationship as well. 400 Enterprise Ireland companies either there or doing business there, 45,000 uh, Irish jobs directly resulting from investments from your area um, and, and a relationship that is, is deeper and stronger and more mutually beneficial in the economic space than ever before. It's also really strong politically, uh, both at state level, but also um, what your representatives in Washington, uh, who are our minister and Taoiseach, see on a regular basis. And of course, US support and California support for our peace process right through recent decades has been essential, uh, both at, at national level and at state level and at city level, and remains so as we go through renewed challenges that we thought we'd uh, left behind. Um, so happy to take any questions on those relationships. I mean, I think one of the reasons I'm particularly sorry not to be there is just to see our new Ireland house. Um, we are fortunate in Ireland to have a government that is more committed than any of its predecessors to Ireland being present and active throughout the globe. It's one of the consequences of Brexit, one of the few beneficial consequences, that we realize that we can't take just our traditional relationships for granted, but we have to back up uh, that investment with people and good people. And that has also meant, in addition to investing in new parts of the world where we haven't been present, it means doubling down and reinvesting in places where we have a rich presence like in the Bay Area. And so Ireland House is a very visible demonstration of that. You're all there and see it. I've only seen it in photographs and very much look forward to seeing it in person. But we've got a great team there, as you know, uh, led by Robert and Diren. We also have a new consulate in, in Los Angeles um, and obviously north of the border in a different country in Canada. We've opened in Vancouver. We have more places right across the US than ever before. We're putting more people into it, both in our consulates, but also with the state agencies with whom uh, we have a, a vital and close relationship. And so Ireland House, the place where you are, is just the physical manifestation of a level of engagement with the Bay Area in California that is deeper and richer than ever before. Uh, and we're fortunate that we'll have senior government ministers there over the coming months, one representing as Minister McGrath through the St. Patrick's Day period, who will certainly attest to that and hope you have a chance to uh, to meet up with them. Look, as I said, um, I'll take questions on Ukraine um, later, but I, I, I think I, I, the level of seriousness, the somber mood that has descended right across the world, particularly in Europe, I can't overstate that. This is um, not altogether a surprise because of the intelligence that we have been getting uh, since November, but it is nonetheless deeply shocking. It is a tearing up of the rules-based international system it's a fundamental challenge to our way of life. Uh, it's a fundamental challenge to our values. Um, and it could potentially lead to a huge realignment of the European political and security order. Um, but it's also seen Europe and European countries come together in a level of unity that's unprecedented to move very quickly on a sanctions package that is the strongest EU sanctions, sanctions package ever enforced. Uh, and we've been able to do that within a matter of days. And we've also seen what is a very powerful reminder of a common sense of values between so many people in the world, and most especially our common values in Europe with our friends in the United States, and our common values with a country that has just left the European Union, Britain. Um, and, and those things that divide us pale into insignificance when we see the enormous and brutal challenge that we're facing to our way of life. Uh, in the East. So look, that's why I'm not there, but it's extremely uh, uh, serious times. Um, we, we have, you know, in Ireland, sets of vital relationships. And first and foremost, we're anchored in the European Union. We look out and engage in the world as a proud and successful member of the European Union. And then, of course, we engage bilaterally in our most important relationships with the United States and with Britain. And we manage a web of relationships uh, with our friends and countrymen in Northern Ireland. And for the last five years, since 2016, those relationships that we've had as a government with the European Union, with Britain, and with the United States at political level have been dominated by the consequences of the UK decision to leave the European Union. Um, I wish it were otherwise, uh, but, but prior to this Ukraine crisis, when our Taoiseach when our foreign minister, when other ministers go to Washington, go to London, go to Brussels, this has been by far the most dominant and important issue. 
And while we, of course, respect the democratic wishes of the British people as they so voted in that referendum, there's no disguising the fact that it has been a profoundly negative development for this island. It's bad for Northern Ireland. It's bad for Ireland. Um, and it, we have spent essentially five years in risk mitigation mode. So all of that, uh, all of those negotiations that you've seen that have led to the trade and cooperation agreement or the Northern Ireland protocol that you'd have heard about, all of those measures are, are risk mitigation measures. An enormous amount of political and economic and community energy gone into making something less bad than it otherwise have been. And instead, we have missed the opportunity to focus instead on all those things that provide energy and positivity and opportunity. But that's the space we're in. And I think by most standards, the Irish government and the people on this island, north and south, have done a good job of mitigating uh, those efforts. The protocol, it should be remembered, was a British uh, choice. Uh, it was their type of Brexit that they chose. There were a whole range of types of Brexit they could have chose, but they chose a hard Brexit. The current British Prime Minister chose the protocol as, as his preferred form of Brexit, and he subsequently won re-election as Prime Minister on that basis. Um, and we'll touch on, on a few moments with Matt on some of the consequences and some of the learnings uh, from that. What I would say is that we've been very unfortunate in Ireland to get remarkable support across the European Union from Brussels, from the Commission, but also from every member state. And when Brexit first happened, there was a fear in Ireland amongst people, if not the government, that when economic push came to shove, some of our member states would put Ireland's concern behind the concerns of their own economic interests. And nothing could have been further from the truth. I mean, the level of unity, solidarity and support that we've received from every single EU member state has been remarkable and unstinting notwithstanding all the crises that they faced, from migration to financial crisis to COVID to security threats that we now see, they have stood by Ireland to a remarkable extent. And that has impressed Irish people, North and South, uh, and that it's led to a strength and support uh, for the European Union. And we've also had remarkable support from the United States, both in Washington from the President, from Congress, and at state level. Uh, the level of support for for assisting Ireland in mitigating those consequences of Brexit has truly been uh, remarkable. In a nutshell, the protocol is, is aimed at preventing a hard border on the island of Ireland, on protecting the Good Friday Agreement, on facilitating continued North-South economic cooperation, and preserving as much as possible of normal life North and South that existed prior to Brexit. It is a massive effort on the EU's part to try to mitigate the very worst consequences of Brexit. And also it's an opportunity for Northern Ireland because it gives Northern Ireland business an opportunity to have full access unpeded to a single market of nearly 500 people and at the same time have free and unfettered access to the, to the, to the UK market. And it's that opportunity piece uh, that most businesses in Northern Ireland get and understand. It's that opportunity piece people in Northern Ireland get it's not to say there haven't been problems, there have. There have been challenges, uh, but what I would say and what we can touch on in a minute is that the European Union, along with the government that I work for, um, has worked creatively to try to mitigate those challenges that have arisen for people in their daily lives and has come up with practical and creative solutions to those and is in ongoing negotiation with the British government to try to get agreement that can be of a more permanent nature so that people can get on with both living their lives, but also making sure that business in Northern Ireland can benefit from what are uh, very real opportunities. So look, I'll stop it there. Um, I'll take the questions. That's the scene setter. Again, sorry I'm not with you and very much looking forward to your questions. Uh, thank you, Secretary. Um, it, you, 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 I'm sure you would really much rather be here today. It's a beautiful morning in San Francisco. We're looking past this large screen right now at the San Francisco Bay and the fog rolling in through the sun. It's beautiful. <laughs> and you will, um, if you could see the faces in some of our consuls here, the jealousy about this amazing space that, uh, <laughs> that Ireland has, um, yeah, you would certainly wish you were here. It's, it's a phenomenal investment in the people and the economy of San Francisco. Thank you for making it. And, and to Robert does too. It's a, a great space. Um, while, you, while you were talking there towards the end about, um, about Brexit, um, 
And uh, I, 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 it got me thinking a little bit, you know, that Brexit was essentially a stress test of the European Union. And you would have to say, given the response of, the, of our European partners, that it passed with flying colors. And um, I, I'm going to take a little personal liberty, and, and because my mother would kill me if I didn't, um, I, and to thank you and your department and the minister for the absolute blinder you played during the, the Brexit negotiations. It was definitely a source of great national pride to see Ireland standing tall and holding true to the, to the, 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 the Good Friday Agreement and making sure that that was not compromised in any way and to have our European and American partners standing with us and behind us all the way was, uh, I think, testament to the reputation Ireland has built internationally and the work that you and your team have done. So, so thank you for all of that. You, you've done, done incredible work in that regard. Um, so um, to follow on from that, the current state of Brexit talks, obviously the protocol is, is, is a constant source of conversation and, uh, and, and to a degree in certain quarters um, controversy. Um, what, what are the current uh, status of, of Brexit negotiations relative to the protocol? Are changes afoot and what might they look like? Yeah, sure, man. Thanks. So um, protocol came into effect uh, with the new trade and cooperation agreement in January of last year. Um, and rather than sort of accentuate the positives and opportunities, there was certainly a decision taken by some to play up um, the downsides rather than, ben rather than the opportunities. So there's been a whole series of rolling political crisis in the interim. Um, the EU uh, negotiating team is led by a vice president of the European C Commission called Maros Sefcovic, and he leads negotiations for Europe with the uh, British Foreign Secretary at the moment, Liz Truss. Prior to that, it was uh, David Frost. Um, the Commission has come forward last October with a very generous and substantive package that it believes would largely resolve some of the issues of most concern to some people in Northern Ireland. So it would remove 80% of some of the SPS checks that are in, that are in place in Northern Ireland and 50% of the customs checks. So essentially, it would, it would go a very long way to removing the concerns around you know, borders in the Irish Sea, uh, unnecessary checks, uh, delays for business, those kind of concerns that we've heard from some areas. It's also addressed some of the concerns that were there about potential restrictions on access in Northern Ireland to vital medicines. So, so they've had a look at what's, what's causing problems in the North. Uh, the Commission has met extensively with stakeholders in Northern Ireland, and it came up with this package. And really since October to now, uh, the, the British and the EU have been in negotiations about trying to reach a permanent solution. Um, they kind of reached ahead last week uh, when they had uh, a meeting between the two principals. No overall agreement was reached, but they agreed to keep talking. Uh, they said some progress had been made, but they're conscious that we're effectively in now to an election period in Northern Ireland with the assembly elections taking place on the 5th of May and the window and opportunity to reach agreement um, is closing while we're in an election. But the atmospherics between the two teams are better than they were for most of the period last year. Both sides say they're committed to reaching a conclusion. We are, from an Irish government point of view, are very satisfied and pleased with the approach that the European Union is taking. And, and we believe that the package that was put on the table last October would resolve the difficulties that are there. And we've been encouraging the British government uh, to try to reach an early agreement on the basis of that package. Um, so you mentioned that you know, some people have been focusing and accentuating the, the potential uh, negatives or downsides of Brexit, but there, are, have, there have been considerable upsides as well. I mean, I work for a business organization and the Northern Ireland Chamber of Commerce has been one of the loudest cheerleaders of the protocol and the, the, the Brexit agreement that, that uh, was signed because it does op offer additional opportunities in trade. We've seen uh, a great increase in trade north-south and a great increase in sort of ferry routes, et cetera, trade routes between Ireland and, and, and Europe. Um, can you maybe explain a little bit more and, and go into a little more depth on, on some of those benefits? And yeah, so let's say you're, you're in the Bay Area there and you're, you're looking at Northern Ireland and how's it's doing economically and it's been in the news a lot in terms of controversy because of Brexit. But, but since uh, the protocol came into effect, uh, Northern Ireland's economy 
has recovered significantly more quickly than anywhere else in the United Kingdom from the COVID experience. Uh, there is now uh, the highest ever levels of interest in Northern Ireland as a place to invest in FDI. I and mean, that's just a fact. Uh, freight tra traffic moving through Northern Ireland ports uh, is up 20%. Uh, and has had one of its busiest periods ever. So more people internationally are looking at Northern Ireland as a place to do business and to invest. And why is that? Well, it's self-evidently the case that if you're in Northern Ireland, operating in Northern Ireland, selling out of Northern Ireland, you have access to the full single market of the European Union of 500 million people. There is nowhere else in the United Kingdom has that opportunity. And at the same time, you in Northern Ireland have an opportunity to sell as a business free uh, of restrictions into the rest of the United Kingdom. So you can look both ways. And therefore, as a business proposition, it's very attractive. Um, and, and the main stakeholder uh, representative organizations get that. They get that. And what I've always thought about business is business and business people and people in your room there would know this better than me. Um, I think business people want to get on uh, with doing business, with cutting through red, red tape if they can, with knowing what they have to do and getting on and doing that. But crucially, they need uh, stability and political predictability. And that's been the piece that has caused some uncertainty over the last year, as there has been this uncertainty over the implementation of the protocol. And, and Communities along the border, both north and south, have, have probably um, suffered more than uh, anywhere else on the island um, post-partition, you know, markets being separated, you know, different, different uh, protocols uh, being the word of the day uh, for trade, etc. cetera. Uh, Brexit and the protocol did offer some opportunity for the alleviation of, of, of that division. Um, and we were seeing sort of, sort of green shoot of, of economic development and some additional investment. Um, can you maybe comment on that and the status of, of some of those investments that are ongoing? Yeah, look, absolutely. I mean, it was, it was just a step back. I mean, when uh, the referendum happened and the result was known, uh, we realized in Dublin that we would have to educate uh, EU capitals all over again on, 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 on Northern Ireland and on the relationships on this island. I mean, the EU had been incredibly supportive of the peace process, but it just wasn't politically a place that they had to think a great deal about, uh, thankfully, over recent years. But what was really incredible was the number of senior European politicians who asked us to take them uh, to the border, to stand on the border, to meet communities uh, whose, whose towns and cities and farms and houses, in some case, literally straddle the border. Uh, and when they saw that and they... They, they had an opportunity to speak to local people and they saw the, the potential risks if there were hard borders or hard infrastructures re reintroduced in Ireland, they became particularly supportive and particularly interested in making sure that we reached a permanent solution that in no way jeopardized um, that status quo, that no border, that no checks, that no infrastructure on the border. And so that has that physical lived experience of senior European politicians being on that border uh, was crucial. You know, at the same time, the, the government here set up something called the Shared Island Initiative, which is a major flagship project. Uh, you're talking about a potentially a billion euro investment in what we call Shared Ireland projects uh, up to 2030. Um, and this is about investing in infrastructure and research on an all island basis that helps um, build peace and stability on the full island, that improves infrastructure, particularly infrastructure along those uh, border towns that you mentioned, infrastructure between north and south. And so, for example, things like uh, the Ulster Canal, the Narrowater Bridge, major north-south research program across the higher education sector. I mean, the government wants to do that politically because it's good for north-south, it's good for stability in the island, but we also want to back it with an unprecedented amount of money and are committed to doing that 500 million up to 2025 and then an additional 500 million out to um, 2030. And that commitment you know, is, is cross party here that, and there's very, very strong support for it and crucially very, very strong support amongst the electorate for it as well. Thanks. You mentioned that we're approaching election season in the North and you know, having grown up there, you know, politics are very binary, they're tribal. 
Um, they're not very complicated. Um, Brexit introduced sort of a third dimension, uh, particularly for unionism. Um, you know, the, 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 the on-off yes-no politics um, suddenly became a little more complicated and, and you know, it would be hard to argue against the, 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 uh, the fact that, you know, unionism has somewhat botched its approach to, to, uh, to Brexit and we are heading into a, an election. Um, the DUP has removed its members from, from the, uh, the parliament in the north. Um, uh, I, I know you can't go into too much detail on politics, but um, um, do you foresee this being a long-term move? Um, and um, can, will we see a restoration of, of democratic um, uh, established uh, uh, institutions in the North in the near future? Yeah, I mean, just again, taking the lens back a bit, I mean, you know, the, the majority of significant majority of people in Northern Ireland voted to stay in the European Union. And I think the fact that a decision taken in London uh, and by the, by the British government and then endorsed by a referendum uh, and people in Northern Ireland clearly not supporting such a fundamentally strategic shift in direction for them in their daily lives uh, had a profound impact uh, in the North, both politically, but amongst people generally. And the principles that underpin the Good Friday Agreement um, were, in the eyes of some, uh, tested and threatened by that process. Um, and so identity, which we all know is such a sensitive and core issue in the North, has very much been brought back to the fore by the experience of Brexit. And look, if I'm a young person and uh, I was born post the Good Friday Agreement in 1998, and I live in the North, um, and I travel around Europe all the time to study or to work, and I have friends north, south, in Britain, in the north, um, and I have friends across Europe, and I have a proud passport, both British and Irish passports, and they both have EU flags on them. And if my community in the north as a whole uh, vote to remain in the European Union and consider the European Union to be core to my identity and consider our membership of the European Union to be a core principle of the Good Friday Agreement and really speaks to that core vision that John Hume had. Um, and if that's taken away as it, as it was, um, then I think that that inevitably shakes a lot of the certainties that that generation had about Northern Ireland and, 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 and builds up questions around identity. Um, so it's profoundly challenging, uh, and I'm not, I'm not putting a label on that as the nationalist community, I think it's profoundly challenging to one's identity in Northern Ireland. Um, and then on the unionist side, um, there's no doubt that the way in which some have portrayed the protocol on these islands uh, has very much played up the identity and the threat to that identity from having things, as some people would describe it, as borders down the Irish Sea or differences between regulations and doing business in, in England or in Great Britain, as opposed to doing business in, in, um, in Northern Ireland. And so, so that playing of identity um, has caused political problems. That's not to say there also haven't been some practical problems as a result of the protocol. And we in the Irish government recognize that, but we also believe that they're so, they can be solved and that the EU is committed to solving those problems. So now we're in a political situation where we're working towards assembly elections in May. Um, the, the first minister from the DUP has resigned and they're automatically, the deputy first minister has to resign. But under new legislation, the ministers can stay in place doing their jobs uh, for a number of months. So ministers can still take decisions um, and they will be able to do so until the elections take place on the 5th of May. We'll see what those elections throw up. Um, opinion polls clearly show that there is a there is a possibility that the that Sinn Féin will end up with the largest number of seats, and if that is the case, they will have the opportunity to have the position of first minister, which they've never had before. And obviously, uh, that will present significant uh, political decisions for for people on the unionist side, um, and will be a moment that that we haven't been in before. Um, so I I'll be careful in what I say politically around that, but there's no doubt that the politics of the next few months 
are going to be challenging. Um, but I firmly believe, and this government firmly believes, that most people in Northern Ireland want the political system, north and south, east and west, to get together uh, to, 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 to have an executive, to have a first minister and deputy first minister, and to get on with making their lives better and facilitating the opportunities that are there in the protocol. But the politics will remain undoubtedly somewhat challenging for the coming months. Thanks. You, you mentioned in your in your uh, answer, uh, you name checked John Hume, and obviously being from Derry, he's a political hero of mine, and and he saw the European Union and um, Ireland's membership and, and and Britain's membership of that body as a vehicle for peace and reconciliation on the island, and I don't think he was very far off the mark. And obviously, Brexit has um, created some challenges in that regard. Um, so moving back to sort of the geopolitical conversation that we started with, um, Ukraine pulled papers yesterday to join the European Union, and I saw some polling numbers this morning that's uh, uh, something like 80 plus percent of European Union voters, member uh, populations were supportive of, of Ukraine's application to join. Um, so it, it's, it's clear that the European Union, again, it, it was stress tested through, through Brexit and passed with flying colors. And we're now seeing it um, expand as, as not just a vehicle for, for trade and for commerce, but for, um, for social cohesion and camaraderie and for sort of the, the, um, uh, the expansion of democratic principles um, on, on Europe, uh, on the European continent. Um, can you maybe comment a little bit on this development? Um, you know, Obviously, what's happening in Ukraine right now is very fresh. It's very raw. Uh, we can't make predictions on what's going to happen long term. But the very fact that um, that Ukraine is looking to the European Union, not to NATO, not to anywhere else, they're looking to the European Union for support and leadership is a very telling development. Uh, can you maybe comment on that? And yeah. then maybe tie it back to Brexit um, and, um, you know, Perhaps is there some buyer's remorse um, across the Irish Sea for uh, for making the decision that they did? Yeah, I mean it's a great way to, to put it. Look, I, I think um, I, I'm very conscious that the European Union sometimes is difficult to explain in in some parts of the U.S. You know, I think that 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 very often in the states people people think of Europe. Uh, in terms of, of, of its bilateral relations with, with individual countries. And sometimes um, the, the EU is seen as kind of, a, kind of a, a, a trade block and it's not quite sure what it is. And, you know, the famous thing, who do you, who do you call in Europe if you want to talk to Europe? So I think that, I think the way to put this is that, you know, I grew up thinking that the European Union was, was on a kind of permanent path of progress stability, uh, where the idea of somebody leaving, at least a vital member like the UK, was unthinkable. And if you look at literally over the last 12 years, you've had enormous crisis for, for Europe, from the financial crisis to a series of migration crisis to sort of permanent threats from Russia really to the east since Crimea in 2014, to, to if I'm frank, significant challenges presented by to the transatlantic relationship from uh, President Trump's administration um, to the increasing kind of geopolitical tension with China, uh, and then of course COVID um, and the rise of populism. Like Europe has been buffeted by an enormous level of challenges within that period. And yet I think most Europeans feel more proudly European than ever before because what we've seen, and you clearly see this now uh, since the invasion last week, is that Europeans get that actually what we have is quite a fragile construct. You know, the EU doesn't have an army. Um, it is a set of laws and values and, and, and an increasingly polarized and contested world. That appeal to common values is something that Europeans are more proud of than ever before. So while Europe, has come together through the decades out of self-interest, economic self-interest as a trading block. Today, what holds us together is actually our people's commitment to those values. And, and you're absolutely right, Matt, and you put it very well, that it's really interesting that at their moment of greatest crisis, the, the authorities in Ukraine 
are calling on the European Union to accept them in as potential members, knowing that that's, you know, knowing that in the middle of a war, that's not something that can be practically delivered, but as a signal that they belong with us and our community of values. Um, and that's what makes that appeal incredibly poignant. It means, you know, I was just out there getting a sandwich at lunchtime and, and there's just random cars driving around Dublin, you know, with, with, with the Ukraine flag colors hanging out the window or bumper stickers. So that, that connectivity is really, really powerful. And, and you're right to bring it back to John Hume. I mean, John Hume just had a very powerful message, which at its core was a simple message. Like he would stand, you know, as a proud member of the European Parliament located in Strasbourg and would constantly remind those members of the European Parliament of, of the fact that that city was a real fault line between France and Germany and remind people time and time again in Europe, but also in Northern Ireland, that um, that difference is an accident of birth, as he would say, um, and that we have an obligation to, to recognize and embrace and celebrate that difference rather than fight over it. And to accept that where we're born is an accident of birth and where we inhabit or what island we inhabit is an accident of birth. And we would be far better off just trying to uh, learn and appreciate that difference and find structures in which we can share that common space rather than spend our time uh, divided and killing each other over it. And, and his message, you know, his message is, is more relevant today than, than ever it was. Um, you know, his passing relatively recently was an enormous loss. Um, and, and I think his message and his role in Irish history will grow and strengthen as more younger people become aware of it. Um, I have to say, as, as um, a frequent visitor to the Hume House in West End Park as a young teenager, um, my early appreciation for the European Union was um, cartons of Dunhill cigarettes under the stairs and <laughs> cheap, cheap German wine by the case um, that we consumed <laughs> as, uh, as youngsters at Great, at great Liberty. But um, I will uh, open it up, if you don't mind, uh, uh, Secretary, to the floor for questions, if we have a few. We have some roaming microphones. and. Um, Happy to take, so please, yeah, please put your hand up, make yourself known if you have a question. We can't all be that shy. It's good to see the office that, um, it's good to see the, I'm, I, I happen to be the accounting officer for the uh, department, which means that I'm accountable for all the money that's spent on property abroad. So this is, the, this is a very good way for me to physically see uh, the office. Yeah, I just have a, a question about what, in the eventuality that um, Sinn Féin were to win the election in May and then get the first ministership and that the unionists would, would refuse to, to go back into the assembly. Could you explain the mechanism in the Good Friday Agreement, the, uh, the joint government authority? Could you explain that, please? Yeah, I mean, look, you know, there were, there were changes introduced um, uh, in the new decade, new approach agreement that was agreed a couple of years ago. So. Um, certainly our focus will be after the uh, election in supporting all efforts to form an executive as quickly as possible. And I, I think it's important that we don't um, assume what the election outcome will be. Uh, the formal campaign hasn't started yet. So let's see what the election throws up. Um, let's see who the largest party is. Let's see who the nominations for first and deputy first minister uh, are and let us jointly, the British and Irish governments uh, and the parties in Northern Ireland focus uh, solely on trying to establish that executive as quickly as possible. In answer to your question, the mechanism is that there can be um, a significant period thereafter uh, where the ministers that are currently in place right now can remain in place while further efforts take place uh, to form an executive. But I, but I think certainly the government that I work for uh, would like to avoid uh, focusing too much on, on negative hypothetical situations and just want to make sure that we can do everything we can to make sure that executive is established. But you're right. I mean, obviously, you know, the state of play on the protocol and the negotiations on the protocol between Brussels and London will be central to the prospects of a restoration of the executive after the election. I mean, that's, that's true. And so it would be extremely helpful if those ongoing negotiations could make as much progress as possible in advance of the election. 
particularly around that issue of uh, goods going from Great Britain into Northern Ireland and not leaving Northern Ireland, and then the related issue of border post checks on those goods. Thank you, um, Secretary General. I guess I, I would love to understand what does the government of Ireland um, do in preparation, if anything, on the, the very human level of potential eruptions of violence again in Northern Ireland to the extent, you know, I think I'm extrapolating a little with the strong man moment we're seeing in Russia going into Ukraine, right? That's a strong man moment. When you see the Russians out in bravery to say, we're not totally supportive of this, um, it comes down to personalities and strong men. And on a much smaller scale per capita, Northern Ireland has certainly seen that in its own history. So I guess I'm having flashbacks, having walked the Gabar he rode in 1999 as an observant, as an outsider, just completely there to observe. Um, I wonder, given what the, the outcomes of May might be, what does is, what is July hold? And therefore, can you comment any, and can Dublin do, does Dublin do anything tactically, or is that out of your remit? No, no, good, good question. Um, I mean, I think, notwithstanding all the political uncertainty um, over the protocol over the last uh, 15 months or so, um, the level of disturbance at street level um, has fluctuated. You know, there, there was clearly, you know, an increase in, in, in tension around about Easter of last year, but but generally, um, generally that has not been the case. And both political leaders, community activists, you know, the Irish government are doing everything possible to uh, to mitigate the risk of that. Uh, but you're right. I mean, there's no doubt that uh, that a prolonged period of a political vacuum is decidedly unhelpful to the process of peace and reconciliation in Ireland. I mean, that's a fact. Um, and so that is why we have spent such an enormous amount of political energy, and my boss, Minister Coveney, has and our Taoiseach in trying to reach agreement on the discussions on the protocol so that we can have stability and that we can get away from the attempts to inject identity politics into the discussions around the protocol. Um, and, it, you know, the, the lessons right back to the, to the 90s is being active, active, active at ground level, at community level. It's why we have, you know, a, a, from an Irish government point of view, we invest more money than ever before each year on what we call peace and reconciliation projects, directly supporting community groups on both sides financially, uh, but also with, you know, with, with, with support and engagement in their efforts to build uh, reconciliation on the ground. It's why we're investing in, you know, as I said earlier, a billion euro over the next nine years in shared island projects that help infrastructure, uh, that help the economy. So the government is engaged politically at that EU, Brussels, EU, UK level. We're engaged in community level in terms of political contact and we're engaged in terms of financial support to community groups through our Peace and Reconciliation Fund, and also strategically in investment investment products uh, projects. But you know, but the entire peace process requires sustained, the hard work, putting one foot in front of the other, being engaged, showing up, and and when there are risks of violence or spikes in violence, being present with with local actors to try and put them out. So my question, I don't want to embarrass myself, but it seems very basic. Brexit means that the UK is no longer part of um, the EU. And I know they had to redo all their trade agreements and other you know, agreements that they had with the EU and with other, like the US and stuff. And now you're sort of saying that Northern Ireland is doing really well because, um, because of trade. How... How, 
how is Northern, how can the EU ensure that Britain has its own trade agreements whilst Northern Ireland, I mean, why is Northern Ireland doing so well? I mean, should that yeah. not be, can you understand my question? <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I, I mean, I, the first thing I'd stress is that this is really complicated stuff um, and, uh, and it confuses all of us uh, and certainly myself as well. So um, your, your, your question is entirely valid. Um, I suppose the, the thing is, the, you're absolutely right. The UK, including Northern Ireland, has left the European Union, not in the European Union. Um, and there were various types of a future relationship it could have had with the European Union, but it chose quite a, quite a hard one. Um, but under the, uh, under the agreement reached between the EU and the UK, Northern Ireland remains in a situation where it can have full access, unimpeded, to the European single market. So it can continue to sell goods throughout into the EU in a way that the rest of the UK can't. And therefore, it's an attractive location. If I'm a company, for instance, in the US who wants to uh, get a foothold in the European market and sell both into Britain and into Europe, um, Northern Ireland's a pretty good place to do that from under this current arrangement. Um, so that's, that's why Northern Ireland uh, is doing better than the rest of the UK in terms of the speed with which it's recovering from COVID. It's early days, it's early days in the process, but, it's, but it is a place that is um, attracting a level of FDI investment that is probably unprecedented. In, it, in its history, but I mean, we need to see that carried through. Um, and I think what we would say is, well, can you just imagine if the politics was settled, if we had an executive working properly, if we had the North South Ministerial Council operating properly, um, if we had the protocol fully implemented in a way that everyone could agree with, that political uncertainty was removed, then it could really kick on and benefit from the full opportunities that are, that are there. Um, and so that's the space we're in. We want Northern Ireland to succeed because it's good for Northern Ireland. It's good for this island. Uh, and we'll continue to do everything we can to make that happen. But your question is entirely correct and, and valid. Thank you. Do you have time for one? We do. We uh, have 10 minutes. Of the Mr. Secretary second. General, thank you very much. I'm a uh, Council General of Italy in San Francisco. Uh, Robert, uh, colleague and friend. First of all, congratulations for opening the Island House. I think it's a great success. I think Robert has been doing a great job because I know what it takes, uh, <laughs> procedures and especially under COVID. Uh, so first of all, congratulate, congratulations for, for, for this uh, great success. Uh, I have a question. Uh, well, two countries, I would say, Italy and Ireland, uh, share a common feature, which is uh, huge communities abroad. Do you agree or do you think that uh, after Brexit, we have uh, as countries and having these big communities abroad, like the one in the Bay Area, San Francisco, North and Western California, uh, it's something which, uh, which can uh, even strengthen uh, and, and foster even more uh, the, the investment attraction opportunity for our two countries because we have rich communities in every field abroad, and that could be a great resources, uh, resource for, for both our countries. Uh, what do you think about this? Thank you. Yeah, I, I think I um, couldn't agree more. Uh, we've spent quite a bit of time, as some of your audience will know, in this country, uh, building business links with our, what we call our diaspora, all across the world, but particularly with the United States. And Robert would be uh, to the forefront there of making sure that our Irish connected business people are as networked as possible. Um, and we've been very successful at that from an FDI point of view in building um, uh, opportunities for Irish businesses in the Bay Area. Um, the way I always put this is that, you know, business people are not going to come and invest necessarily in Ireland because they had ancestors who were Irish, but they will take a second look at Ireland. They they will have a connection and an interest and they will look at our business proposition because of that uh, historic connection. And if the investment stacks up um, and if the opportunity stacks up, then, then that opening door opportunity of a, of a connection through the diaspora matters hugely. And we have a long list of examples of that uh, from Coca-Cola to Ford 
right back multiple decades and many people there are the same but crucially what's happened is once people make an investment in ireland uh, whether they have an irish connection or not generally their experience is extremely po positive and they have reinvested in next generation technology and there's no finer example of that than the many tech companies who are in uh, california have done so uh, repeatedly but but that's an area that we i'd like to think that ireland is a world leader in uh, along with a number of a small number of other countries who deliberately build Irish connected business networks. You know, we, we're a small country, uh, but we have a massive global diaspora and it's an invaluable source of soft power that we mine a lot. Looks okay. like we're calling it. Yeah, I think we're, we're going to any more questions. No. We've got one more question in the back. Actually, it's our commissioner, our police commissioner, Jim Byrne, also Grand Marshal of the of the parade this year. Can we give Jim a little round of applause on his on his honour. Jim, um, I was wondering, do you um, preliminary trade figures came out? Uh, you know, with the year of Brexit, and it showed obviously Ireland's trade with the UK going down, but more interestingly, it showed that inner trade on the island of Ireland had significantly gone up. And obviously when, um, if, that, if that trend continues, that's gonna have significant political ramifications besides economic uh, ramifications. Uh, I was wondering if you care to comment. Yeah, thanks very much, Commissioner. And um, congratulations on Grand Marshal and best of luck, um, I remember marching in the in the parade over there many years ago with a minister um i should say in my introduction i was i was very much pegged as an, an eu expert which i never thought of myself as because my all my first postings were in the states in washington and boston um, and I, I worked with a lot of the community over there in the bay area and various issues so um would love to be there for st patrick's day and good luck with the parade um, it's true exactly as you say like the level of trade uh south north and north south has increased very significantly over the last 12 months. I have to say, we would like to see more time for settled trade figures to emerge. The disruptive impact of COVID um, and the changes to supply chains that flowed from that and the stockpiling meant that the trade figures we would have got for the first certainly six months of last year were, were volatile. Um, and I think we'd like to see another year or so of trade figures to try and make a proper assessment of the direction of travel. It's also true that um, there's no doubt that a perception emerged that uh, that uh, bringing goods in through Northern Ireland ports, there might have been a perception that it was easier to do that uh, in the context of the protocol than bringing goods into Dublin or other ports. And so initially, some people, through word of mouth rather than actual reality, might have decided to 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 invest in that in that route. So we would like to see the. We would like to see the figures settle down a bit and make proper assessments based on them. But you're absolutely right that, that we want to see in this government a thriving, vibrant, all-island economy. And we're investing heavily in an infrastructure to, to support that. And if the trade figures you mentioned uh, are confirmed and are confirmed over a couple of years' experience, that will be evidence that business is ahead in many ways of politics and is driving an agenda based on an intensified all-island economy, which is something that we've spoken about for at least three decades, and that the Irish government, more than anyone else, has invested in and will continue to, to do so. I think that's a good way of wrapping up the session. So uh, everyone give um, Secretary General Joe Hackett a big round of applause. The, the Secretary General has told us he's going to come out before the summer. We're going to hold you to that, Secretary General, all going well. Uh, and we hope that uh, we can maybe do this again, maybe in person with you at some point when you're, when you're here the next time again, because this has been, uh, for me anyway, a lot of learning. Great to hear your perspectives on these things in person. Uh, we see them written down, but always, always more texture, I think, in the, in the, in the oral response, the verbal response. So I uh, thank everyone for coming here this morning. Uh, hopefully this will be we'll, we'll do a lot more of these over the next couple of months as we as we come out of uh, what's been a very difficult two years. It's been so nice this morning to see so many familiar faces. Um, I
better than two years ago, but that's, uh, uh, but you know, uh, I think we, we're gonna have a couple of, couple of great months ahead of us before the summer. Uh, thanks so much. So we'll, we'll, we'll be on to you. Keep on our mailing list, check us out on Facebook, Twitter, our social media. We'll be doing events, obviously, Patrick's Day, and we look forward to seeing you then. Thanks very much. Goodbye.